please welcome to the stage, Donald Saddleway. You know, uh, the electricity powering the lights in this hall was generated just moments ago because the way the grid operates, supply must be in perfect balance with demand everywhere at all times. Speak up. You want me to speak up? Okay. Well, I'll do that. Well, let's start again. Sounds like people. Can people hear in the back? No. Yes? No? All right. You see, you can tell I'm a professor. Very relaxed. All right. So the electricity powering the lights in this theater was generated just moments ago because the way the grid operates, supply must be in perfect balance with demand everywhere at all times. So what you're looking at here is the world's largest supply chain with zero inventory. And how do we deal with this balancing requirement? We deal with it by excess capacity and redundancy, which leads to enormous inefficiency, underutilization of assets, generation, transmission, distribution, and also excessive emissions. Now, add to the mix the environmental imperative, which says we should be deploying more and more renewables, such as wind and solar, but they are intermittent, and by themselves they cannot be fully integrated into base load. So how do we deal with this intermittency? With excess capacity and redundancy, with all that inefficiency. You know, electricity at zero marginal cost, that is in excess of the needs, the demand, it's useless. It doesn't help at all. What's worse than no electricity? Bad electricity. If supply exceeds demand, voltage rises, frequency rises, and that will destroy all of your appliances. Can you imagine if every time you went to plug in a device, the question you got to ask yourself is, do you feel lucky? Do you? Storage is the missing piece. Batteries would allow us to draw electricity from the sun even when the sun doesn't shine. Batteries would do for electricity what refrigeration did for our food supply, what storage tanks did for our water supply. But attempts have failed to deliver a battery that can meet the harsh performance requirements of the grid, namely super long service lifetime and super low cost. It's time for disruption. And this means radical innovation in battery chemistry, but it's not going to be easy. Next slide, please. For innovative research, I turn to the university. Remember, the first battery was invented by a professor, Alessandro Volta, at the University of Padua. Here we see the first battery, a stack of coins, silver and zinc separated by cardboard soaked in brine. Volta's invention gave birth to a new field of science, electrochemistry. And in just 10 years, in the absence of entrepreneurship, mentoring, in the absence of innovation hubs, in the absence of venture capital, this invention gave birth to new technologies, electroplating and electroforming. Overlooked is the fact that Volta's invention for the first time demonstrated the utility of a professor. Until Volta, no one imagined a professor could be of any use. But Volta showed that if you give a professor resources, students, money, leave alone, he's liable to come up with something of societal value. Next slide. Next slide, please. Ah, thank you. When I started to work on the problem of large-scale energy storage, I avoided battery experts never turn to incumbents for advice. They don't innovate, and they can't help you do so either. Instead, I sought inspiration from outside the battery field. I looked to a device that neither generates electricity nor stores electricity, but rather consumes electricity, vast quantities of it. Here you see a modern aluminum smelter running without interruption 24 hours a day, 500,000 amperes at 4 volts, and yet it can turn dirt into metal for less than $1 per kilogram. So I looked at this thing, 
And I reasoned that if I could teach it to store energy and give it back on demand, in the end, I'd have something that's big and cheap. That's scalability. The point here is to ask the right question. Other battery researchers start with a battery, one that's sized for a handheld device, and try to figure out how to make this thing big enough for grid-level storage. No. I started with something that is not a battery, something that consumes colossal power, but makes metal cheaply. And I proceeded to figure out how to store charge in this thing. I basically figured out how to run a smelter in reverse. This led to my invention of the liquid metal battery, now under commercial development at Ambry, a company I founded along with two of my students. You can expect the first product to be out in about year 2020. Now, for economic viability, I impose cost constraints on the active components. This means restricting materials choices to earth abundant elements. I forbid my students to go to certain parts of the periodic table. I mean, I could build you a fantastic battery out of tellurium, but what's the point? Tellurium is about as earth abundant as gold. It won't scale. I say if you want to make something dirt cheap, make it out of dirt, preferably dirt that's locally sourced. That's way you have a secure supply chain. And this also means that batteries for Africa will be built in Africa by Africans using African resources. That way they become authors of their own future. Next slide. Now my research was conducted at the university by people who were new to the field. Almost nobody in this image had studied electrochemistry before or had worked on batteries before. I taught them how to think about the problem and then I set them loose. This is in stark contrast to research in corporate laboratories conducted by seasoned veterans, the battery industry. Remember, the lithium ion battery didn't come to us from the battery industry. So here's my team, young, bright, unjaded, intellectually fearless, and motivated by the higher sense of purpose. They just want to change the world. They want to achieve the goals of SDG 7. That's all. So to summarize my formula for innovation, ignore incumbents, draw upon inspiration from outside the field, and conduct research at the university with Arab East. What else would help? Aligned incentives. For example, change the investment rules, the tax codes, to encourage high net worth individuals to unleash patient money that is driven by concern for their legacy and maximum societal impact, not by maximum profit in the shortest time with minimum risk. With this flood of new funding, we'd see an acceleration in scale and speed. Now I want to end by responding to Rachel Kite's opening remarks yesterday in which she said she hopes that we'll all leave this forum energized and inspired. And that conjured up for me a memory of President Kennedy's speech at Rice University in 1962, the speech in which he uh, justifies his decision to put a man on the moon. And when viewed as a metaphor, that speech is about much, much more than space travel. It's about taking on great technological challenges like grid-level storage at the price point of the electricity market or uh, electric vehicles competitive with internal combustion. In an, to paraphrase my favorite line in the speech, and I'm going to take some liberties here, we choose to work on universal access to sustainable electricity, not because it is easy, but because it is hard, because that goal will serve to organize and measure the best of our abilities and skills, because that challenge is one that we are willing to accept unwilling to postpone, and one that we intend to win. No one left behind.